Revelation 19 through 21, part 4. This is scene 7, seven final views of history, or seven views of final history. It consists of number one, the warrior king. Number two, an invitation to birds. Number three, the end of the beasts. Number four, the dragon chained. Number five, the saints reign with Christ. Number six, judgment day. And number seven, the new heavens and the new earth. We're in the last scene of Revelation. Each segment of this climactic series of seven is introduced by and I saw. We might call it seven final visions of history, but of what segment of history? There's the rub. Here's the controversy, especially as it has to do with the thousand years mentioned in parts four and five. We've talked about how the pre-mill and post-mill and amill positions differ. In quick summary, the pre-mill camp sees this entire scene as future and its parts chronological. Someday Jesus will come as a warrior king, put down the beast's rebellion, throw them all into a lake of fire, chain Satan, and rule with the saints for a thousand years. Then Satan will lead a final rebellion, be defeated, and thrown into hell, along with everyone else who fails a final judgment. Post mills also find in the passage a somewhat literal millennium, where Christians come to dominate in world affairs through the Holy Spirit working through his church. Then Christ will return for a general judgment and put the final touches on an eternal state. What these groups find in the passage has a lot to do with what they come looking for. Amils, however, come to the passage without bias. They let the text itself wholly inform their understanding. Not. Let's not fool ourselves that we can ever come to the Bible without presuppositions. No one does nor can. Perhaps the healthiest thing we can do then is to pause from time to time to see if we can recognize our own presuppositions, or at very least be aware that we have them, as does everyone else. If we differ, chances are that's why we disagree. Most likely those who fail to agree with us are not just being stupid or obstinate. Most are sincerely trying to understand the text, yet are coming with different expectations. The challenge is to recognize and examine critically those biases we have, both theirs and ours. Now what would an amil understanding of this text be, and why? What presuppositions might an amil have? Likely that the text is neither chronological nor literal. The entire book is made up of word pictures, metaphors, poetry, it's not a schedule of future events, but an art gallery representing the truths of God. It doesn't merely look future. Almost all its imagery comes from other parts of the Bible. It looks back and summarizes as much or even more than it looks forward. And it is relevant in the present. It was written to tiny struggling bands of believers to encourage them down where they lived. But such has been the pre effect on popular thought that even the term apocalypse, which simply means a revealing or revelation, has changed connotation radically. Even the dictionary now defines it as a sudden cataclysmic, quote, final destruction of the world, as described in the biblical book of Revelation, end quote. But that misses the substance and value of the book almost entirely. This needs to be rethought. If Sean's revelation is poetry, we should expect it to be organized according to the patterns of especially Hebrew poetry. Parallelisms, inclusios, chiasms, anthropomorphisms, metaphors, laments, and all the rest. We should look for such patterns and understand them as such. The apocalypse does point to literal truths, absolute and binding, but it does so in metaphor and symbol. Even the fragments, which might make sense if taken literally, could they too be here contributing to the book's metaphors, rather than suddenly changing genre mid-sentence? If we don't consider this possibility, we may paradoxically miss the literal truths to which it points. 
in a male fashion, we have argued that the first part of this seventh scene is depicting not what Jesus will one day become, but who he is and ever has been, a warrior king doing battle for his people. But the New Testament defines fighting and victory in a very different way than we usually think. When Jesus battled Satan in first century Palestine, it was not with a sword, but by faithfully keeping to his mission and his witness to the very end. If we recognize that, we ought to see that this is precisely how he wants his people to follow, fighting in the same way he did and still does in his gospel battle for the world. Parts 2, 3, and 6 of this scene, whose imagery all comes from Ezekiel 38 and 39, does not likely represent two similar events separated by a thousand years, but forms a poetic antithetical frame around the author's central point, the millennial reign of Christ with his people, while Satan is bound. In Amil language, this could be stated, yes, all our enemies will ultimately be destroyed. That's the frame. But even now we reign with Christ, and Satan can't stop us. That's the main point. But again, that means we need to understand binding and reigning very differently than does Wikipedia. Does the Bible give us warrant to do so? Yes, it compels us. It does so not in metaphor, but in teaching texts. Jesus is even now in control of the universe, and he exercises some of it through his people. In this, all mills and post mills can agree in principle, but we reign not by dominating world politics and institutions, pace post mills, but by serving and taking care of that portion of the kingdom assigned to us. If I, your Lord, wash your feet, you should wash one another's feet, not lording it over our kingdoms, but lording under them, royal caretakers all. Perhaps it would now be a good time to step back and survey what this whole book has been all about. Recall it was first written to churches living as outcasts in their communities, worshiping at the risk of their lives. To these, Jesus first gives an awesome picture of himself and assures them that he is both sufficient and able to meet their every need. He takes them seriously. He acknowledges their fears and the difficulties they face. I know where you live and how hard things are for you. You live in an enemy camp. And for some, things might even get worse. But he doesn't just commiserate. In fact, he does something we might at first not completely understand. Something which might even appear a bit calloused. He issues them orders. Repent. Clean up their act. Is he just pouring salt on wounds? Not at all. What else would one expect from a commander to his troops? though for the moment they might not recognize who they are. All that would have to change. But even what he commands is nothing overwhelming, beyond their reach. It is something they can and must do. Hold fast to their gospel witness. That is the one thing that matters. He assures them of his love, his provision, and presence. He tells them they will certainly prevail. In the rest of the book, he slowly, step by step, reframes their thinking. He gives them a God's eye perspective on the created order, its design, its inexhaustible supply source, its redeemer, and the role of God's people who follow behind him. In principle, scene two is not that different from scene one. Did you catch that? Next, he assures his troops that though he will send judgments of every kind to punish and restrain his enemies' evil designs, none of it will harm them. There will be no collateral damage either from his initial measures or the final judgment which will inevitably come. In scene four, he then shows their commission to build his church or kingdom by love and gospel, though Satan opposed them with all his might. In his antagonism, he will enlist nearly the entire world's governments and institutions, great monsters with formidable resources. 
but it is all bluff and bluster. It is God's army who by simple faith and trust will prevail. Revealing the dragon's form is not to dishearten them, but to let them in on the beast's tactics, mainly that the church can avoid using those same tactics herself. Babylon's give-and-take alliances might look sound, even formidable, but they inevitably fail to deliver and usually end up turning one group against another. It is God's tactic of love that is in the end to conquer everything, evil, justice, and all. Now after this, the church is beginning to recognize who they really are and the role to which God had called them. They're ready to see it now again from one final climactic perspective. From that vantage point, they can now see that it is really they who reign over their circumstances. It is they who have the upper hand. It is God who is unstoppable. His church will be built, no matter what any enemy throws against her, against us. It is not that someday victory will belong to a church alive at some future time, but the victory is the stuff of which it has been made in every age. It has been victorious through and through, its crowning triumph, faith. The clues have been there all along. In chiastic form, the last scene also corresponds to the first. That all saints have reigned with Christ since he ascended to the throne has been its message from the start. Had Jesus not said he had come to make us kings and priests, we are that already. Ephesus was commanded not to push on to achieve some elusive goal, but to go back and recapture something they'd lost along the way, something they had right from the start. Though Smyrna seemed feeble and bereft, he told them they were rich. Thyatira, by simply holding on, had a share in Jesus' authority over the world. Sardis already had their white robes and should take care lest they soil them. Philadelphia had an open door that no one can shut. Even Laodicea, though in need of discipline, had an open invitation to enter Christ's heart. The Lord's most prevalent command to them all was simply hang on to what you've got. Victory is not only our goal, but our possession. To reign is not something future, but our task as Christians even today. Overcoming is everything else that radiates out into our lives from God, together with its justification and sonship, all belong to that fullness out of which we are called to live. Here then is the book in a nutshell as it summarizes the Bible for us and as it bears on our lives in whatever conditions we find ourselves. Those who see prophecy as prediction, I fear, miss much of its relevance today. Those who see overcoming as something belonging to some future church having political clout fail to see that victory has been the stuff of which the church has been made all along. Thus the post-mill vision of victory seems to me too narrow. The main reason I find the Amil approach most attractive is not that it has solved the precise meaning of all the imagery, but because it makes room for all the possibilities, which is perhaps the best we can do. Prophecy can help us recognize what we might otherwise miss. It helps reframe our conceptions. Like Jesus' miracles, they draw back the curtain to reveal what's even now going on below the surface. That's what revelation truly means. God is at work today. He is even now putting into effect the salvation, once for all gained by the sacrifice of his son, now being expressed in the lives of sons and daughters who work by his side. Can we see him? How else can we follow his lead? Now we're ready to move on. We're almost there. We really have only two segments left. First part six of our current scene, Judgment Day, and then part seven, which simply is expanded to the end of the book. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, 
the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, let's unpack this imagery. What does it mean? And then, what's its relationship to us as Christians? Is there really a judgment day for us? What would it be like? And if there is a judgment in any negative sense, what could be its purpose? What might the imagery of verse 11 suggest? How about stature or importance? Imagine a room full of people who each stand up, one at a time, in order of social prominence, power, fame, wealth, morality, whatever we might use as the measure of a human's character or position. But then God stands up, and those differences suddenly become negligible, like the differences in elevation of various mountain peaks on Earth when seen from the moon. Every peak will be brought low, and every valley raised up, relatively, when God stands up to judge. Nowhere will God's transcendence be manifested greater than on Judgment Day. It is wholly the day of the Lord. And if we're counting on our moral achievements to make us stand out above other people as the basis of our judgment, think again. We're all sinners in the same boat. Our personal difference is negligible. How about the great white throne? Throughout the Bible, God is pictured as dwelling in heaven, a higher plane of the created order, created nonetheless. This he shares with angels and certain departed saints, but his throne belongs to God alone. This too is an image of his utter transcendence. It is impenetrable to human gaze. Had he not revealed himself to us, we could know nothing of him. He's not hiding from the skeptics. He's just too big to see, and he has revealed himself, yet they're blind to it. He has spoken, and they're deaf. They refuse to hear. They won't see. Many others have seen and heard him, and it has changed their lives. But a day is coming when no one will miss him. On Judgment Day, God will stand up, so to speak, and all will perceive his glory. At that time, no difference in human stature by any scale, certainly not of righteousness, will matter in the least. The only factor that will mean anything is whether one's name is written in the books or in the book. For those whose names are not written in the book of life, it will be a time of stark terror. Will they be thrown into a literal lake of fire? Not likely. Will it simply consume the sinner, or will it punish them in some eternal dreadful existence? It is sometimes said that the slightest sin deserves eternal damnation because it is an offense against an infinite being, or so said Anselm. But what then would we say about a single good deed done for him? What a strange infinite math. So what can we make of it? All we have to go by are images and metaphors. But what could they mean literally? And what could it mean that death and Hades, sometimes translated hell, are themselves thrown into the fire? Perhaps a few things we can say more confidently. First, the second death is not benign. Fire or burning is sometimes used in the Bible to describe human desires run amok. Drives become lusts like addictions that can never fulfill. Without God, how could they? Second, 
If the lake is a permanent environment of continued existence, as it surely seems to be in scripture, its nature is justice. No more, no less, if one would dismiss the usual descriptions of hell as grotesque exaggerations, perhaps that unembellished fact alone would bypass that excuse and give even the cynic food for thought. Third, whatever its nature, it is certainly quarantine. Its evil will no longer contaminate God's good creation. Now what about verse 13? Does it apply to Christians? Do the books have anything to do with us whose trust is in Christ and whose names are in the book for whom Jesus died and was raised? Maybe we should forgo verse 13 and skip right to 16. Unfortunately, 16's been lost. So I guess we're stuck with 13. What can we say about it? The source of this book imagery seems to come from several places in the Old Testament, one of the clearest being Daniel. Daniel 7.10, a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, the books were opened. Or Daniel 12. Now at that time Michael the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until this time. And at that time your, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. But will Christians be judged in a negative sense along with the rest? Let's consider some relevant passages. Ecclesiastes 12.14 for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Jeremiah 17.10 I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Or Jeremiah 32.19 Great in counsel and mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. Then from the New Testament, Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. This sounds like a universal statement. Notice it begins with for, which usually means it gives a reason for something that has just been said. This sends us back a verse to Matthew 16, 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Here Jesus is not talking about a reward, but salvation, saving one's soul. That cannot be merited by our righteousness, but only by the righteousness of Christ, except in the sense that his deeds become ours as his gift. Thus, any passage that speaks of Christ's judgment for salvation has the caveat that he is really being judged by Jesus' good deeds. But what of Romans 2, 6 through 11? Who will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress of every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Does this caveat apply here? A few texts seem written specifically to Christians. Romans 14, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, said the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. 
So then each one of us will have to give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. 1 Corinthians 3 Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it. What day is that? Because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will receive loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. A chapter later, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. Setting aside for the moment judging a Christian's sin, what can we even confidently say about the reward? That God will recompense good deeds is fairly clear, but what its nature could be, less so. Would it be wealth? Reputation? Fame? That would seem unlikely, given the tenor of the New Testament regarding such things. How about responsibilities? That might seem more fitting, as Matthew 25, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. A few passages refer to receiving a crown. Paul said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day and not to me only, but unto all them also who, that loved his appearing. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Paul called the Philippians his joy and his crown. Yet I think it more likely that the saint's crown or reward is less something we get than something we become, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is from Daniel 12, 3. Leslie Newbegin has offered the thought that not only will saints be raised, but all the good things they've ever done, somehow to become parts of the new order. Nothing good will ever be lost. What do you think it means in 198 of this section of the book? It was given to her, the bride, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. If we're dressed in Jesus' righteousness alone, what could this imply? One solution might be to look for another translation. The authorized version says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. This would leave room for the idea that we are dressed in Christ's righteous linen made ours. The problem with this is that righteousness is plural in the text. Thus, most translations render this the righteous deeds of the saints. Perhaps a better approach would be for us to recognize that Judgment Day is more than just that. The day of the Lord will indeed bring final judgment, but it is also a day of revelation, of reward, and restoration. It is something legal, but more. It is a time of revelation where God will unveil for all to see, even enemies, publicly who Jesus truly is, and those who are truly his, standing by his side, and then of course those who are not. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, 
who say that they are Jews, but they are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and make them know that I have loved you. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. For the Christian, it is also ultimate discipline and sanctification, a kind of final restoration. Again, in 1 Corinthians 3, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a, a spiritual body. If the nature of the saints' reward is a bit fuzzy, what could it be with regard to God's judging our sins? Paul reveals that the saints will somehow participate in the judging process of even angelic beings, if only as witnesses. But for what purpose would he judge sin that the death of his son is already covered? Could it serve some role as a deterrent for us now, or some final step of sanctification then? Surely it cannot have anything to do with our paying our share of the curse. Even in this life, we are sealed against that completely. The best answer I've been able to find is from an old hymn by Robert Murray McShane. With that, we'll close. When this passing world is done, when has sunk yon glaring sun, when we stand with Christ in glory, looking o'er life's finished story, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. When I hear the wicked call on the rocks and hills to fall, when I see them start and shrink on the fiery deluge brink, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. When I stand before the throne, dressed in beauty, not my own, when I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. When the praise of heaven I hear, loud as thunders to the ear, loud as many waters noise, sweet as harp's melodious voice, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then how much I owe. Chosen not for good in me, wakened up from wrath to flee, hidden in the Savior's side, by the Spirit sanctified, teach me, Lord, on earth to show, by my love, how much I owe.